Hey, I'm so glad you're all here with me tonight. And um, I've been looking forward to sharing this lesson with you. This is really an important lesson, and it runs parallel to last week's lesson. As we're going through this uh, book and know why you believe, last week's lesson was, is Christianity rational? Can a thinking person, and the, the argument is that if you're a thinking, intelligent person, of course you're not going to believe in Christianity or, or God or anything else, and because it's not rational. And yet, some of the most intelligent people who have ever lived were, were Christians and, and still are. But tonight's lesson that we're going through, Is There a God?, really runs parallel to the one that we looked at last week, and because it, it forces us to examine and consider proofs of whether or not God really exists. Are there proofs? Can we, can we look at credible evidence and say, this points to the existence of God in the same way? Last week, we asked, can, can we look at credible evidence and prove that Christianity is a valid faith system for our lives. And so this, this lesson that we're going through is going to be an important one, and it begins with this whole question, does God exist? And, and if I could start out this way, I believe that this question is the single most important question in our lives for any of us. Everything, categorically everything that we are, that we think, and that we do is a reflection of how we answer this question. Everything that I think about my life, about why I'm here, what I, what moral accountability I have, what my responsibility to others might be, everything that I am, everything that I think about and focus on for this life, for the future, for what happens after death, everything that I do in terms of how I live my life for myself or others, uh, for kingdom service, everything comes back to this single question. It is the most important question that any of us will ever answer. Does God exist? And it is so important that in Psalm 14 and in Psalm 53, we have the single statement that really defines why this is so important. When David writes in both of these psalms, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. Now, this is really an important statement. Uh, it's more than just oh, somebody's foolish if they don't believe in God. The word fool in the English translation is the Hebrew word nabal. We, we sometimes say nabal when in the life of David, he meets a woman who's married to a man named Nabal. His actual name is nabal. Now, nabal does not mean you're stupid. And this is really important. It's not somebody who lacks intelligence. There are a lot of people who are smart. They have PhDs. They could run circles around any of us. And yet they don't believe in God. They don't believe in God's existence, and they're considered by God to be Nabal. Not stupid not lacking intelligence, but rather the word Nabal refers to somebody who is impious, somebody who has no spiritual perception, no understanding of ethical or religious truth. Again, not stupid, but naive or ignorant. The meaning of the text is not that unintelligent people do not believe in God. That is absolutely critical for us to understand. I'm not smarter than somebody who has a PhD just because I'm a believer and they're not. Rather, the meaning of the text 
is that sinful people do not believe in God. They either deliberately choose not to believe in God, or they simply, because of their moral blindness, cannot see him. It is a wicked thing, a sinful thing, to deny God. And somebody who is a spiritual fool or chooses to live in spiritual ignorance and denial, that's the person that the Bible warns us, don't be like this. Don't be like this. Don't be like this. Don't be foolish. Don't be ignorant. Don't be naive. None of it, it doesn't say don't be stupid. Don't let yourself fall into the trap that so many millions and millions of people believe today. And that is that this isn't an important matter because God doesn't exist. It is, it is a decision in question that has absolute eternal significance. There's no other way to say it. No other question I'll ever answer has as much life-changing and eternal significance as this one. Now, when we're thinking about this issue of does God exist, and the fact that spiritually naive, spiritually ignorant people don't believe in God, I think it'd be good for us to take a few minutes and just talk about, well, then, how do unbelievers understand either the existence or the concept of God? And there are seven major views of God that are popular in our world today. The first one is the straight-up atheist who says there is no God. God doesn't exist. And it doesn't matter how many proofs that we show somebody, they choose to live in ignorance. They choose to live in denial, and they say, no, no God. Now, the agnostic view of God is a little bit different. Instead of saying there is no God, the agnostic says if there is a God, then we simply can't know him. He's too far removed from us. And if, if this God were existing, and we can't know if he does or doesn't, he never reveals himself to us. We have no way of experiencing him. Remember how last weekend in church we were looking at Ephesians, and, and as we were talking about the experiential knowledge of God, it's the same that Paul uses in Philippians 3.10 when he says, I want to know God, epigonosco, I want to know him intensely. And the agnostic says there's no way that we can know God personally or intensely or experientially like this. Now, the third major view in our culture today is the pantheistic view. Now, this is very popular in what we call the New Age movement. And if you could say that certain regions of our country are more given to certain philosophies or religious thoughts, it's kind of like you know when you're in the Bible Belt, right? Well, you know when you're in the New Age Belt up in the Northwest, uh, in that whole Washington, Oregon area. Man, the New Age movement is so strong. And the pantheistic view is that God is in everything, nature, people, everything. God exists equally in them. Um, several years ago, when we were visiting some relatives in the Seattle area, Rose was with her aunt who is so, so deep into the New Age thing. And the aunt asked Rose, uh, Mary Beth is her name, and Mary Beth asked Rose if she wanted to go with her to get some things for a terrarium. 
and you know, sure, Rose went with her, and Rose was absolutely stunned when Mary Beth would pick up a rock and she would talk to it, just like you and I are talking in a conversation. And she would say, would you like to go home with me? Would you like to be a part of my terrarium? And she genuinely believed she was hearing back from the rock saying yes or no, or whatever else she picked up. And because this, even though it was a rock or a branch or something else, she believed that God was in that and that through that, God would talk to her in through the rock. And it's just, it seems absolutely crazy, but this is one of the most popular perceptions of God in our culture today. Now, the fourth view of God is the polytheistic view. And this is very different from the pantheistic view. The pantheistic view says there's one God, but he is in everything, equally existing, and can communicate to us equally through all things. Only one God in everything that he's created. But the polytheistic view says there are many gods, hundreds of gods at times depending on your belief system. Um, when I was in Aurora and pastoring there for 20 years, when I started, my church was bordering the property of the Hindu temple that's there. If, you, if you're ever riding down 88 and heading west, you'll see the big Hindu temple. And uh, Right, right on the west side of Aurora at Randall Road, and my property of my church was right there again that bordered them. And when missionaries would come, I would actually take them over to the Hindu temple so they could see what it was really like. And statues to all of the different gods, a hundred different gods that are represented in Hinduism even more in other religions. And they make food sacrifices to every one of these gods. And they, they sincerely believe that there are multiple gods with each of them with their own characteristics. Now, you can go all the way back to the ancients, whether it's in Greek or Roman mythology, and they say all of these people are, are gods, of, a god of war, god of peace, god of this, god, god of blessing and prosperity, you name it. And, and this still exists today in religions like Eastern religions, uh, such as Hinduism. And uh, boy, I mean, it's almost oppressive and scary at times when you, when you experience what, what's going on in this kind of a, a polytheistic environment. Now, the fifth major view of God that is popular in our culture today is what's called dualism. The dualistic view is that there are actually two great spiritual forces. Now, if they were personified, it would be God and the devil. One God, God the Father, who is always at war with the bad God, the Satan, and they are always in combat with each other. And sometimes one is stronger than the other. And on any given day, depending on the circumstances, Satan may be getting a little bit over God. God may be getting a little over Satan. But God and Satan are the personifications of the dualistic form, but we know the dualistic concept of God best because this is at the very heart of the Star Wars movies. And all of the Star Wars movies, whether you're talking about the original trilogy or all of the, the redos and add-ons and you name it, all come down to the force, the good side of the force, the dark side of the force. 
And when they're praying, they're saying to somebody, essentially they're praying, may the force be with you. They're, they're essentially saying, may the good side of dualism be stronger than the dark side of dualism. And so today, it's it's just part of popular culture and English idioms that, you know, we want the force to be with you. Now, the deistic view of God is historically significant because most of, not all of the founding fathers, but most of the founding fathers in America were deistic. You had, you had people like George Washington who had an authentic understanding of biblical faith. But clearly, Thomas Jefferson or Ben Franklin or others represented more the deistic concept. And in deism, they go back to the monotheistic concept of God. There is one God who created everything. But in deism, that God started everything in motion. He created natural laws that would govern the universe, every part of the govern of the universe. And then God simply steps back and lets everything go on. And the popular title of deism is the clockwinder theory that God started everything in motion, wound up the clock, and then just stood back, and the clock is unwinding in nature. And everything will continue until the clock is unwound, and then it falls apart. But that God that created everything isn't knowable because he's removed himself and now everything is left to function according to natural law. God doesn't get involved in our lives. God doesn't perform miracles. God doesn't answer prayer. You'll find this over and over in the, the writings of the founders. Now, Thomas Jefferson was a pure theist. Uh, in the Thomas Jefferson Bible, very famous, but Jefferson went through and he edited out everything in the Bible that represented a personal God. He took out all the miraculous nature of, of you know, Jesus' life and other things because he did not believe in a personal God who is personally involved in our lives. Ben Franklin was a little quirky in this. He leaned on the deistic side, but it's interesting, one of the most famous quotes from Ben Franklin was that when the, uh, this, the Revolutionary War was at a point where it looked like America was going to lose, it was Ben Franklin who encouraged the delegates to pray because God had been with them and carried them and given them success. So it's really unusual that Franklin leaned deistic, but he also did believe that God had personal involvement in our lives, certainly more than the other others who were deistic. Then here's the last one. And this is so popular in our world today, the Muslim view of God. And we see what's happening in the world with the growth of the Muslim religion, all of the jihadists that are involved today in our culture. So how does the Muslim faith, Islam, treat God and what do they believe? And the Muslim or Islam view is that Allah is God. There is one God. It's monotheistic. Not many gods. But Allah is his name, his primary name, in the same way that Jehovah or Elohim are the primary names of, of our God. They say Allah is the primary name 
of this monotheistic God, but he has at least a hundred names. And so they would call him many different things, but Allah is his primary name. Now, Allah in, in the teaching of Islam is a monotheistic God. There is only one God, not a triune Godhead, but one God. But to understand who that God is, is very difficult. Three words that help you remember the Islam or the, the Muslim view of God. Allah is vague. Allah is per, impersonal. And he is stern. Those are really important because they represent a completely different biblical worldview of God. A worldview in which you have one God only in one person who can't be known. He's vague. He's impersonal in that he doesn't get involved in our lives at all, but we're still obligated to obey him. And if we don't obey him and live to honor him, then he is a stern God who punishes severely. That's what drives, literally drives, every Muslim, is this understanding of God. It is very different, very uh, polar opposite of what we understand about the God of the Bible. So, does God exist? It's the heart of this question. Proverbs 10.4 is such a... A critical verse to our understanding of this whole question, does God exist? In Proverbs 10.4, in fact, it's so important that I want to share it with you in three separate translations. The NIV says, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all of his thoughts, and this is so important, notice how it says, in all of his thoughts, the unsafe, for the unsaved, there is no room for God. His life is too crowded. His thought processes are too busy, chaotic, or whatever else. But I love this translation. There is just no room left for God. My priorities, my chaos, all of this other stuff blocks out any opportunity for God to be a part of my life. The NLT version translates the same verse by saying the wicked are too proud to seek God. They seem to think that God is dead. And that kind of goes with the cartoon up at the top of the page here. God is dead. One person says God is dead, but the average person in our culture says, who's God? I don't even know who this person is. But not only is there not room for God, but they think he doesn't even exist. He's no longer a living necessity in my life. I, it, it just doesn't matter. And then the ESV or the English Standard Version says, in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek God. All of his thoughts are, all of his thoughts, there's no God. See, and this is really the heart of the question. If the question, does God exist, is the single most important question that we'll ever ask because it determines who we are, how we think, and how we live. According to Proverbs 10.4, in all of his thoughts, there's no God. And so it doesn't matter how I am. The only thing that I'm governed by is self-motivation, self-preservation self-exaltation, because I don't have to be accountable to anybody else. I can live any way that I want, because there is no eternal consequence to anything I do. And so everything, everything is based on what makes sense to me, what do I want, what will make me feel good. And you end up in this philosophy of life, not believing in God, with a, a practical 
if not both philosophical and practical sense of evolution and survival of the fittest. So it's it's me against the world, or I help others because it makes sense and it's good for me that I do. Not because there's any moral accountability or eternal consequences. So this question of does God exist it really is at the heart of everything, everything that we are, everything that we think, and how we prioritize our lives, and everything that we do. Now, you remember I told you last time we met that this whole idea of apologetics has nothing to do with making an apology for something that I do, but rather the word apologetics comes from a Greek word that means to give a defense or explanation of something that we believe or do. You can see that one of the earliest formal writings that we would call an apologetic was actually written in the early 1600s, mid-1600s, by Blaise Pascal, a Frenchman and a, a French philosopher. And Pascal came to genuine faith in Christ and wanted to write an apologetic book. And he started working on this book, and the intended title for his book was La Apologie de la Religion Chrétienne. And it literally means an apologetic of the Christian religion. He never finished the book. He died before it was completed. And so editors took that, all of the work that he had done, and instead of giving it the formal title of La Apologie de la Religion Chrétienne, they just called it Pensies or beliefs. And they said, here's what Pascal believed. And what Pascal wrote as really the heart of his apologetic for Christianity, he said there are two major truths about Christianity that should drive us. Number one, that there is a God who men are capable of knowing. And number two, there is an element of corruption in men, sinfulness in men, that renders us unworthy of God. So these are the two great spiritual realities. God exists. God wants us to know him. We can know him, but we, have, we all have a sin problem. <clears throat> now, in writing this apologetic, and this has become one of the most well-known and famous arguments for Christianity that Pascal came up with. And he said, here's the what, what he called the wager. He figured that if people understood the importance and the consequences of their choices regarding faith issues and, and God, they would end up by self-motivation, if at nothing else, coming to the point of saying, I need God. I need to understand him. I need to be connected with him. And so he said, here are the two juxtaposed issues in the wager. Number one, if God exists, that's the first primary aspect of the wager. If God exists, if I believe in God, then I'm going to experience eternal happiness, and, and I come to faith in Christ, and I have heaven, essentially. But if God exists, and I don't believe, then the only consequence is eternal misery or hell. All right, so you've got this really critical issue. If God exists, I have a choice to make. If I choose to believe, I experience happiness. If I choose not to believe and God exists, then there's consequence, terrible consequence. But what if God doesn't exist? If I believe in God, he says, 
if God doesn't exist and I choose to believe, yeah, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. There's no negative. Now, it's funny, Paul would say, <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, if if God doesn't exist, if Christianity isn't true, then we're miserable people because we've spent all of our time living and working for something that really wasn't true in the first place. But but Pascal said, no, if, if we believe in God and he's not really there, it doesn't hurt us anyways. And if we don't believe, but God exists, then there's punishment. And if we don't believe and God doesn't exist, again, it doesn't really matter. But when you see this grid here, he would say, look, just think this through. Maybe God doesn't exist. And that he's using a rational argument here, not a biblical argument, but he's trying to rationalize and say, okay, if, if God doesn't exist, it doesn't really matter if you believe or you don't believe, you, you end up dying and you're done. But if God does exist, and that's that's Pascal's assumption, basic assumption, God really does exist, but he's trying to help people rationally get there. And he says, if God does exist, you believe and you're going to be okay. But if God exists and you don't believe, think of the consequence. Now, it's really important that we understand when Pascal was writing this apologetic, he was clearly coming from a biblical perspective. He was just trying to communicate it in natural terms that somebody who is an unbeliever might be able to identify with. Pascal genuinely believed that God could be known. He believed that Scripture, miracles, and fulfilled prophecies were the three strongest revelations that God really did exist and does. Pascal is the one who declared that there is a God-sized hole or vacuum in every single person. And until we know God and come to this understanding and conclusion that both God exists and we need to believe in him, that hole is going to continue to be there. And the only way that it could be fulfilled or be, the hole could be fulfilled is if we came into proper relationship with God through Christ. Now, this is all so important because it's it's at the very heart of our of our understanding of apologetics, how we defend ourselves and why we believe what we do. Pascal was one of the first of the major apologetics uh, writers, but and a lot of times we think of somebody like C.S. Lewis as being one of the most important, and yet Lewis doesn't even come close, as, as great as C.S. Lewis is as an apologetic. Most of us don't realize that even in a grander way, Fyodor Dostoevsky was one of the greatest apologetics who wrote, he was a Russian author, and Dostoevsky tried to approach the apologetics issue instead of like the wager of God's existence, God does or doesn't, and the consequences of either choice. Fyodor Dostoevsky approached the apologetic question on the, on the basis of how do we deal with the question of evil, sin, suffering, all of this other stuff. And Dostoevsky struggled with the problem of evil and its existence on the its impact on the existence of God. And Dostoevsky put it this way, and this has become the heart of modern, almost all modern uh, explanation of the sin, evil, suffering question. He said, if God if God, and I, I'm sorry, that should say, is a good, if a good God, oh, I see what I did. I just reversed two words. If a good, if a God who is good and powerful, all powerful exists, then why does evil and suffering also exist? Let that sink in. 
if if God is good and all powerful, if a good and all powerful God really does exist, He's all good and all powerful. And why do we have evil? Why do we have suffering? If God doesn't, and and the assumption that people make is, if God doesn't end suffering, then He's not really good. And he's not really all powerful. Or he doesn't exist in the first place. This is the challenge that many people are struggling with today. And they say, I can't, I can't believe in a God that would allow this kind of pain into my life. How do you tell how do you tell parents whose 16 year old has just died that God is really good and loving when all they know is pain and suffering in that moment? It's an overwhelming question. The other night, you know, and and I know that Melissa was in shock when I was talking with her and couldn't comprehend. But even when I said, "Let me pray for you right now," right while the while the paramedics and the police are in the house, let me just pray for you. And she said, "I can't. I can't do this. I can't believe." that a good God would let my daughter die. And in that moment, I couldn't say, well, Dostoevsky answers this question. Because people feel their pain and they don't understand how a good and all-powerful God could allow suffering into their lives like this. In fact, this issue, when we're talking about the apologetics of God's existence, does God really exist? A philosopher named Alvin Plantinga called this issue of suffering the only good objection to God. No matter what else you could say in favor of God, this question about whether or not God is good and all-powerful and still allows suffering, he said, this alone is enough to not believe in God. Now, in the Brothers Karazov, how do you say that? Karazov? Uh, The Brothers Karazov was one of the most important books Dostoevsky wrote. But his point, and and it's almost like in that book, he almost puts God on trial. There's no other way to say it. There's a courtroom scene, and it's as if he puts God on trial. Because God is supposed to be good and all-powerful and all, and the, he allows this suffering to exist. And in defense of God's existence, or as a proof that God really does exist, he approaches it from two different angles, the positive and the negative. Positively, he writes and says, yes, there, there's struggle and suffering, but while we don't understand how God uses struggle and suffering, God uses struggle and suffering to cause men to look to him because they're weak and helpless in that moment, and there's nowhere else to go but to God. And so God uses the struggle and suffering in our lives to cause us to look for something greater than the circumstance so that we can draw close to him in personal trust. On the negative side of the argument, 
He says, if the existence of God is denied, no uh, one ends up in complete moral relativism. This is so important. In the midst of chaos, we either find God or everything becomes meaningless and we get wrapped up in moral relativism that says, I can do anything that I want that makes sense to me and it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And no matter how terrible the consequences of my actions might be, nobody has the right to tell me how to live. I can do anything that I want, even when it brings even more pain and chaos into my life. Now, I'm spending time on this with Blaise Pascal and Fyodor Dostoevsky because these two men have really defined the argument, the secular argument, better than anyone else, even more than C.S. Lewis, before C.S. Lewis even came on the scene. These two guys as apologetics really defined what everybody struggles with in their lives. Why am I so empty and why do I hurt? That's it. Those are the two arguments that people struggle with in trying to decide whether or not God exists. Why am I so empty? Why is there this hole inside of me? And because there's this hole inside of me, I'm going to figure out how to fill it up with all the toys of the culture. With, with It might be alcohol. It might be sex. It might be anything else. I've got this hole. It's got to be filled. And in the end, it only brings more chaos if I don't find God. And all this suffering and struggle that comes into my life from Dostoevsky's perspective, it if that doesn't lead us to God, then we we absolutely collapse in moral relativism. In fact, if you go back into history, just let's over the last 200 years, some of the greatest public speakers against Christianity, and I say great by the fact of their popularity, some of the most well-known philosophers who were who were unbelievers, regardless of the, whether they're coming from the empty hole side that Pascal wrote about or the hurt and struggle side that Dostoevsky writes about, look at what Robert Ingersoll, the most famous atheist of the 1800s, said, life is a narrow veil between the cold and barren peaks of two eternities. We strive in vain to look beyond the heights. We cry aloud, and the only answer is the, the echo of our wailing cry. Man, you talk about emptiness. Or Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous atheists of our generation, who said, there is at the bottom of everything, ultimately everything, at the bottom of it all, no good, no evil, no purpose, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Man. John Paul Sartre, one of the most famous French agnostics, said, it is meaningless that we're born, and it's meaningless that we die. Bertrand Russell, one of the most famous atheists of previous generation, I mean, vicious atheist, also said that man's origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. That everything that we are is just the accidental result of atoms colliding and connecting that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. And that the whole temple of man's achievements must inevitably be buried underneath the debris of a universe in ruins. He says, all of this is true. There's nothing, nothing beyond what we experience in the moment. And then he makes this conclusion, 
only on the scaffolding of these truths that everything is chaotic, meaningless, and emptiness. Only on the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation be safely built. This is one of the most tragic, empty lives that you could ever see, and yet he was one of the most famous writers, philosopher writers of his day. It's horrible, tragic. And how did, how did people get to this point? What happened? Paul, Paul explains it in Romans 1 when he says, Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts, their unbelieving, ignorant hearts became darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds, animals, reptiles. And mankind, individually and collectively, exchanged the truth of God and his existence for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. This is it. This is From God's perspective, this is how people got where they are today and why they don't believe that God exists, because they deliberately, intentionally chose to replace God with other things. And the result of replacing the only hope for true eternal fulfillment is immediate chaos, emptiness, and eternal destruction. So who is the God that we believe in? Now, we will, we will not be able to understand God, if we don't take a step back and understand the Godhead, there's a difference in our vocabulary between the words God and Godhead. We're used to using the word God just to refer to God the Father. But you have to understand bib biblically, especially in the Old Testament, but also in the New, that God, the word God, represents two entities. One is the person of God the Father, and the other is the concept or spiritual reality of the triune Godhead. And so both were God refers to both, both realities. God the Father, when we're talking about him individually, and the Godhead when we're talking about the Trinity, the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we're never going to be able to fully comprehend the Trinity because this is an infinite spiritual reality, and we are always going to be finite. Even when we get to heaven and we have our glorified bodies and all the limitations of our mind are lifted because there's no longer a sin nature, you and I will never fully comprehend eternal realities. I will never understand how election and free will work together. I know they're true. I know they do. But I will always be limited, and I will never fully understand the Trinity. I have to approach it accepting that reality. I will always be finite, and God will always be infinite. And the Trinity, the triune Godhead, is an infinite reality. But there are some things that we can grasp about this concept of God being a triune Godhead. Now, when we use this picture of try to put it together so that we can understand it, the best illustration that I can give you is the issue of H2O. If I could see you all and you all had your, your mics unmuted, I would ask the question, 
what is H2O? And I'm absolutely convinced somebody's going to yell out water. Right? Now, <laughs> I would immediately respond to your yelling water by saying, are you sure? Really? What if H2O is in the form of a solid? Is it still water? The answer is no. No, it's ice. And if I were to say, okay, it's water, it's ice, but are you sure that's it? You'd say, oh, now you know you're, I'm catching you in a, you know, natural sense that there's more. And there's ice as a solid, there is water as a liquid, and H2O is also steam as a gas. All of them are H2O. That's the essence that makes up ice, water, and steam. And they can all exist given the right temperature, barometric pressure, and weather conditions. All three can exist at the same time, as you see in this picture. Ice, water, and a vapor. All right. Now that we got a, we've got this idea of, okay, H2O is the essence. That's what makes up, even if it, they're in different states of solid, liquid, and gas, H2O is the essence of ice, water, and steam. Once we have that, we can start to understand on a basic level the triune Godhead. Because the Trinity has one essence. Whether it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity has one essence called deity. Deity is the H2O of the Godhead. And deity makes up God the Father. That's the, that's the essential nature. When I use the word essence, I, it means essential nature. The essential nature of God the Father is deity. The essential nature of God the Son is deity. The essential nature of God the Spirit is deity. That's what makes all three of them God. In the same way that H2O is the essential nature of water, ice, and steam. So if we were to put this concept of the triune Godhead into a visual like this, you have in the middle God, not God the Father, but God. God is made up of deity. That's the essential nature of God. Now, it's manifested in three persons in the same way that H2O is manifested or displayed in three separate natural properties. Liquid, gas, and solid. So you have the essential nature of deity that makes up God, and God is known to us not in three different masks, if you will. That's called modalism, where you have one God, and sometimes he appears as God the Father, sometimes he appears as God the Son, and sometimes he appears as God the Spirit. No, all three exist at the same time. Deity is the essential nature, but there is always a God the Father, always a God the Son, and always a God the Spirit. They are three separate persons with one essential nature. And so, Jesus is not the Father. He's a separate person. And the Father is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father or Jesus. They all share the same essential nature, which is deity. And that's what makes them God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The essential nature is deity. And they all equally share that, so they are all equally God. 
when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he didn't say that I and the Father are the same person. But the Jews clearly understood that he was making himself equal to the Father by claiming to be one with God. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was saying, the Father and I have identical essential nature. We are both deity. And that's what absolutely threw the Jewish leaders and the religious leaders of his time, that he was making himself to be equal with God. And Jesus could do that because he was God. The Athanasius Creed is the single most well-known and important creed that helps us understand the nature of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit being one God, but three separate persons. All sharing the same essential nature, which is deity. And the Athanasius Creed says, we worship one God in Trinity, and the Trinity in unity. So there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but they are unified with the same essential, essential nature, which is deity. Neither blending their personalities, they don't kind of blend into one, but at the same time, they don't divide their essence either, that one has more than the other. They all are equally three separate persons with the same essential nature. For the person of the Father is a distinct person. The person of the Son is another. And that of the Holy Spirit, yet another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is one. The essential nature is what is referred to by divinity. The divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Their glory is equal. Their majesty is co-eternal. They all share it essential deity. What quality or what nature the Father has, the Son has, and the Holy Spirit has. The Father is uncreated. The Son is uncreated. The Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable. The Son is immeasurable. The Holy Spirit is immeasurable. They are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings, but there is one uncreated an immeasurable being, and that's God, who's known to us in three separate persons. The Father is eternal. The Son is eternal. The Holy Spirit is eternal because they all share essential nature. And yet, there are not three separate eternal beings. There's just one great God. One eternal being the Godhead. Similarly, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty, yet there are not three almighty beings, but one almighty God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet there are not three gods, but there is one God, and they all share the same essential nature. Thus, the Father is Lord. The Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten from anyone. He's self-existing. And the Son was neither made nor created. He was begotten from the Father alone. And you have to understand when it says that Jesus was begotten by the Father. Now we're talking about his biological birth, not his eternal existence. God did not create Jesus in the pre-incarnate state. Jesus always existed. And the Holy Spirit was neither made nor created nor begotten. And yet he proceeds or comes from the Father and the Son. His mission, his purpose is to represent them. 
Nothing in this Trinity is before or after. Nothing is greater or smaller in their entirety. The three persons are co-eternal, co-equal with each other. And so in everything, as was said earlier, we must worship their Trinity in their unity and their unity in their Trinity. This is one of the most powerful statements when we start talking about the God who exists and how we begin to even come close to begin to understand them. Now, I shared with you last time that there are some uh, very important footprints. If I were walking down the beach and I saw footprints instead of swirly things in the sand. If they were just swirly things, I might say, oh, the water just kind of shaped those and the waves, and it was a natural thing. But if I see footprints, that takes on a whole nother level of importance because that represents something that was intentional and deliberate and, and dynamic. When we're talking about whether or not God exists, how do we know? What proofs are there? And these were the same proofs that I gave you last week when we talked about whether faith is rational or not. But it's so interesting that the verses that are represented take each one of these and say, this isn't just a question of whether or not Christianity is rational or faith is rational, but this footprint is from God. This is God's footprint. When we look at the issue of a complex and orderly creation, Romans 14 is absolute. The heavens declare the glory of God. The earth shows his handiwork. Everywhere that the sun and moon go and the stars go, they shout out, God, God, God. And it's not just the beauty or the complexity, but the orderliness of everything that stays in existence. Yes, there is natural order, there is natural law, but God's the one who holds the natural creation together. When you look at the physical body and the issues of reproduction, why do we all have eyes and ears where they are? It's, it's an aberration if somebody is born misformed. But if there wasn't a God, everybody would be misformed. Everything would be misformed. You may have occasional genetic disorders that happen because of some illness that affects the body. But in a world where there is no God, where there is no complex, beautiful, and orderly creation, everything would be chaotic. There would be no complexity and order as we understand it. Romans 1 is so absolutely clear in verses 19 and 20 that these are the evidences of God's eternal existence and his power. Whether we're talking about the natural world, the stars, the heavens, the earth, and you know trees, you name it, or we're talking about the physical body and the complexity of animate life and animal life, it all points to God if you're willing to see it and recognize it for what it is. And the second footprint of God is that because we were all created in God's image, and theologically there are a lot of different aspects of what it means to be created in his image, but every single person represents the image of God, even though we are severely marred because of sin. And God created us to be like himself in the sense that we are able to think and reason and choose. There is a spiritual nature to every single person. There is a moral understanding. And when you say, wait a minute, I thought we were spiritually dead. And I would say, don't confuse the fact that we have a spiritual nature with the fact that we are dead to God. We are dead to holiness. We are dead to the realization of God. But we were all created in his image. We have intellectual, emotional, and spiritual capabilities. And 
because we were created in his image, there is a sense of morality that pervades everybody in every culture at every time. And it doesn't matter where in the world or what time period you're in, you will find that there are universal moral codes in which some, in some way people understand there, there is right and wrong behavior. And the only way that's possible, the only way that we could all be aware of moral law is because there is a moral law giver who created us. And Romans 2 talks about that, that God has planted in every one of us an understanding of moral law. That's a footprint of God, not just a general footprint for faith, but it points us directly to God. Jesus' miracles and resurrection are also, and isn't it interesting that in Acts 1-3, we're told that Jesus demonstrated infallible proofs. Those are That's the word apologetics. Jesus demonstrated apologetics that he was alive. And Ephesians 1-18-21, the passage we just looked at in church last week, says, the reason that Jesus rose from the grave is because God raised him up from the dead when God exerted divine power. And Jesus' miracles and resurrection are direct footprints of God. They point us directly to the existence of God. The consistency of Scripture is a footprint of God. It points us directly to him, 2, Corinthians, 2 Timothy 3.16. Every single scripture is God-breathed, God-breathed, God-breathed. 2 Tim, uh, Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, the Holy Spirit breathed out, the Holy Spirit, who is equally God, breathed out into the, into the minds of the writers, every single word. And that's why you have such powerful, consistency in the great themes and the doctrines of Scripture. It's not science fiction. It's all reality and truth, and it all points to God. There is no other answer for it. This isn't Tolkien. It's not, it's not C.S. Lewis taking us to Narnia. The miraculous nature of the Bible, including the fact that when we read the Bible, it is a living word that changes us, cutting to the very marrow of our bones and our and our spirit. That's God. It's it's a direct evidence of the existence of God. When we read something and we're convicted, it changes us. We're transformed. It's God. It's it's all God. The changed lives of believers. So I'm sorry, that should say 2 Corinthians core instead of 4. But 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, hey, everything is new now in our lives. We are new people. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that it's God at work in us, changing us. It's not a 12-step process. It's not something that just represents turning over a new leaf. When somebody has a change in their nature, as opposed to just change in their behavior, you can't change nature with self-help or self-improvement steps. Only God can do that. And the changed lives of people represents a footprint or proof of God. Archaeology is interesting. While I don't have a chapter and verse next to that one, it's so. I would just kind of challenge you if you want to see something interesting, just Google the. Uh, there are a couple articles the the ten greatest you know things in archaeology and and such, but. If you type uh, 10 proofs of archaeology or 10 revelations or, you know, discoveries of 
archaeology, you find that there are things that archaeology has now proven that were in the Bible that people did not believe at first. Did you know that for, for centuries, people did not believe that there really was a Sodom and Gomorrah because they have been so completely wiped off the map until archaeology proved it. And in finding tablets in that region, written stone tablets, you know, carved tablets, where Sodom and Gomorrah are mentioned to validate what the Bible teaches. Archaeology is a footprint of God. It demonstrates that everything that God said is true and real. Uh, fulfilled prophecy. There's no other way to explain. Fulfilled prophecy apart from God. Uh, that, to me, fulfilled prophecy is one of the most in, in interesting and incredible footprints of God. And the fact that we reliably understand God through fulfilled prophecy also reminds us that all of these prophecies yet to be fulfilled are going to happen. If God is consistently reliable and able to accomplish the other prophecies, I certainly believe he's going to take care of the rest that haven't happened yet. And then the last one, answered prayer. Answered prayer is one of the most powerful footprints of God. I shared this story with you about the book that I lost. And only God, only God could have answered that prayer and we and help me find it. Others have prayed for things that only God, it wasn't coincidence. It was God who met a need, God who healed, God who answered that, that prayer. Every one of these, when you ask the question, does God exist? There is an element of faith involved. There's no question about that. But if we're willing to approach this, with intellectual honesty and openness, we can look at every one of these eight footprints or proofs and say, yeah, God exists. If you went to my house and you had never met me before, you'd say, okay, there's a closet full of clothes. That points to the fact that there really is a Steve Miller. You can look at my my cars, my motorcycle, and Chris did say, I never ride that motorcycle. Oh, well, then somebody must own it. That points to me. You point to the mowed lawn. You can point to anything you want and say, oh, there's an evidence, a concrete footprint that Steve Miller really exists. Oh, here's a signature. Here's something else, his wallet, a picture. All of these are as concrete, and if you went to a court of law and showed a jury this, they would vote legally. Yes, God exists. God exists. So if we have all of these footprints, what do they tell us about God? What is this God? And we're almost, uh, let's see what time is it, another five minutes or so. Okay. There are three important characteristics of God that kind of define him for us, this God who exists. The first is that God has infinite clarity. He is not the Muslim God who is vague. We have infinite clarity about who our God is. In fact, it's so infinite and so knowable that Proverbs 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. What can we know about God that we can't know about Allah? What can we know about God that we can't know about the force or any of those other false views of God? Well, the Bible is absolutely clear that as you look at the essence of deity, what makes up God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, there are natural attributes, and those attributes are clearly defined for us. He's eternal, he's infinite, he's unchanging, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's self-sustaining. All of these things are true and knowable about God, and there are also moral attributes. 
the moral attributes. He is holy. He's loving. He's gracious. He's wise. He's merciful. He's just. He's faithful. He's truthful. He's also wrathful. He, he punishes sin. These are concrete things that we can know about him. There's nothing vague about our God. He says, I want you to understand me as best you can. Now, I may not understand how all these things work because they're infinite realities. But I'm not struggling to go, oh, I wonder if God is eternal. Oh, I wonder if God knows everything. I wonder if God is self-sustaining. I may not understand it, but I know what God is. God makes it clear and defines his nature for us. Even when we can't completely grasp it, there is nothing vague about our God. Nothing. And when I say God, I mean God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Godhead shares in all of these attributes, both natural and moral. Our God has infinite clarity. This is, this is exactly who I am. But not only is our God possessing infinite clarity, but he also possesses eternal power. And this is absolutely critical for us to grasp. And this is the heart of, of Ephesians 1 that we were looking at last week. Now, our God is absolutely powerful, has unlimited, infinite power, and he uses that power in creation to make sure that we can see his invisible qualities. His eternal power is divine nature. And notice the last phrase. So that people have no excuse for not knowing him. Does God exist? All you have to do is look at the creation of the universe. Look at everything that God has done. Look at the footprints. And you will have no excuse for not knowing God and believing that he, he does exist. Finally, not only is God infinitely clear eternally powerful, but he's relationally, and that should be relationally, he has, he has relational passion. I'm sorry, I'm starting to get tired here, but God has relational passion. That means he, he deeply, deeply desires to be in relationship with us. He's not desperate. God is never desperate, but he deeply desires to be in relationship with us. We're the ones who turned away from him. I love Jeremiah 9.23. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches. But if you're going to brag about anything, let him who boasts, boasts about this, that he understands and knows me. Wow, what a powerful statement that we can know who God is and we can understand that infinite clarity. Again, we may not fully grasp everything because he's infinite and we're finite, but we can understand this God. He's not the agnostic. We can't know him. He's not the vague God of Islam who can't be known. He's not the force that has no distinctive characteristics, just energy. This is, this is God. And he says, I want you to understand and know me. Wow. I mean, this is just amazing. So if all of this is true, there are three core philosophical questions that shape every single one of our lives, every, every philosophy class that you'll ever take is geared toward trying to help you understand and answer these questions. The first one is, who am I? The second is, why am I here? And the third is, where am I going? These are the three great philosophical questions 
that impact every person who's ever lived. And God answers the question in Isaiah 43, everyone whom I formed, I made, especially those who call on my name, but everyone was created for my glory. Who am I? Why am I here? I'm, I'm, I'm a child of God's creation, and I was created for his glory. The great challenge when we help a person understand that is to understand where the, what their eternal destiny is going to be also then. I love the way that A.W. Tozer said, God made us for himself. That is the first and the last thing that can be said about human existence. And whatever more we add is but commentary. We were created by him, and we were created for him. That's it. Essentially, that's all I really need to know. Because that shapes everything that I am, everything that I think, and everything that I do. Richard Trench kind of put that whole Blaise Pascal, God size whole, into a different way of saying when he said, None but God can satisfy the longings of the immortal soul. As the heart was made for him, he only can fill it. God exists, and God is able to bring completion and fulfillment in our lives. One last quote from Francis Schaeffer. Man, made in the image of God, has a purpose. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Man has a purpose. And that purpose is to be in relationship to God who is there. Man forgets his purpose, and thus he forgets who he is and what life means. That's why this question is so important. Does God exist? It's the most important question that you and I will ever answer. All right, real quickly, and it'd be so easy to end with this, but let me just give you one last slide. Why is it then that it's so hard for people to believe in God? Quickly. One reason that people don't believe in God is because they don't like the idea of moral accountability, that they have to answer. If this God really exists, I have to answer to him. And Jesus explained that in John 3 when he said, men love darkness rather than light. Their deeds are evil. They don't come to the light because they don't want their, their sin to be exposed. And moral accountability is a key reason why people choose to reject the existence of God. The second is the fear of man. We saw this last week on the issue of faith. The fear of man lays a snare and to say that, hey, I really believe in God. Can you imagine being in a secular, liberal university and saying, you know what? I choose to believe. It's like saying at a Democratic rally, hey, I like Trump. <laughs> Can you, who, who's going to take that risk? And the fear of man keeps a lot of people from saying, yeah, I, I believe in God. The third reason why a lot of people don't believe in God is because God doesn't make sense to them. How can a good God allow this pain and suffering into my life? Why should I trust him when he allowed, and then you fill in the blank? And then the fourth reason that some people don't believe, we refer to God so often as the Father. And for people who have had harsh, abusive fathers, it's so hard for them to believe that there could be a God who is a loving father. I, I know a person, a woman, who was abused by her father, sexually abused by her father from the time that she was five years old until she left her home when she was 17. Her view of a father was so distorted and warped that it almost seemed impossible that God could be a loving father. And it wasn't until God's grace just 
covered her. Just, wow, it was a miracle. And she came to see that the Heavenly Father was nothing like her earthly father. So powerful. And then one last. And that is because there are so many misrepresentations of God that people just say, if, if that's who God is, is God really the hammer in the sky just waiting to come down on you every time you sin? A lot of people are told that. God is the harsh judge, and every time you sin, he's just waiting there. Or that God is the slot machine in the sky, and maybe you'll get something, or God is the credit card in the sky. And they have all these stupid ideas about God because they were misrepresented by people in positions of religious authority. And for all of these reasons, people reject. And that's why, as I close, I want to just remind you, this is why we're taking the class here. This is why this question is so important, because God strategically places people like you and me in our neighborhoods, families, workplace, and schools so that we can be the light that shines in the darkness. I'm not going to be able to take away the pain of my neighbors who just lost their daughter. And in the moment of shock, it's going to be impossible for them to believe that God is good and a loving Heavenly Father. But God strategically put me next door to them and had them buy the house next door to me so that I could just be a light that shines in their darkness and that I can be the one who can help them find their way back to God. And he did the same thing for you. You're the light. You're the one who's going to give an answer to people for the hope that lies within you. That's what apologetics really leads. If, if all this does is give us academic knowledge and doesn't drive us to give a defense or explanation of what we believe to people who are struggling, then this class is just nothing but head knowledge. And it's, it's really my prayer that we're going to take what we learn here and let God use it to explain to people who are trying to find God, trying, who are hurting and struggling and need hope. So that's what I'm praying for for all of you, is where you work, where you live, for your families, if you go to school. Somebody out there doesn't know God. They need to, and they don't know why they should. And you're the one who's going to help them understand this, okay? All right, that's that's it for tonight. And I hope that this has kind of encouraged and challenged you and been a little bit of enlightenment for you on the whole issue. As, as you know, I don't uh, I don't just go right through the chapter. Let's start and read right through the chapter, and I'm going to answer all the questions. But hopefully, I'm going to answer the questions, you know, through what I'm teaching you. And if if there's ever a time that I don't answer a question that you really want help with, don't hesitate to send me an email. And I'll take time and I'll write out the answer for you and I'll be glad to help you with that, all right? So, hey, thank you. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for praying for my neighbors. Every, every single week at our staff meeting, we talk about people who are struggling, hurting, needing help and prayer, needing God to intervene and step into their lives in a big way. And uh, I certainly need that this week as I'm going to be continuing to to work with my neighbors and and not just not just Lewis and Melissa but all the neighbors around me who who are needing to have some help with this and so I really appreciate and love you guys all right so let me take a minute and pray and then we'll close the class all right father thank you for giving us the time together thank you for what you're doing in our lives so that we can understand and know you better. 
Lord, you've called us to this. You've called us to this class to teach us, to know how to answer the questions that the unsaved have, and to give them a, a better understanding of who you really are so that they can turn to you for help and hope and salvation. So we pray that wherever we are tomorrow, at home, at work, with family members, at the gym, wherever you choose to put us, with those circles of influence that you bring into our lives, let us be the light that shines in the darkness. Let us show people the reality of Jesus as we pray it in his name. Amen. All right. So good to see all you guys tonight. Thanks for joining me. And then uh, I'll see you again this weekend and then in two weeks for our next study. All right. So good night, everyone.